Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned at the start of the service, uh, this is the fifth part of our Bible Reboot series of the life of Christ here during the season of Epiphany. We've got a couple weeks left. After this, we've been working our way through the life of Christ, really the ministry of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your word that is declared through your messages, but also preserved for us in the Bible that we also might declare it and proclaim it and proclaim your salvation to this world. We give thanks also for your teaching as you instruct us on how to follow you daily and how we can live out our lives to your glory. So Lord, encourage us and strengthen us and help us to grow to follow you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So we started out this series uh, talking about the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, his commissioning, where he was revealed to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world for those who are paying attention as the whole Trinity showed up to really send Jesus on his way for his three-year ministry throughout Israel and even beyond Israel and ultimately to the cross to pay for the sin of the world, and then to the open tomb of his resurrection on the third day. We learned about the miracles of Jesus. Uh, Vicar Bryce talked about that a couple weeks ago, uh, and how they tell us a little bit more about Jesus, that he cares for people, he has compassion on people, and that he has the ultimate victory over the pains and suffering we go through in this life, even death itself. You know, through faith in him, we know that our own death is defeated, and we look forward to the resurrection. We learned about discipleship, about the calling of the first disciples, and also last week Pastor Bo talked about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, that it means more about doing, you know, living, and not just what we're thinking. Um, So we've been going through and growing through the ministry of Christ through this series, uh, Bible Reboot. Today we want to look at sermons, the sermons of Jesus, because Jesus had a lot of sermons. He did a lot of preaching. Uh, the, probably the best known example is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Uh, those of you that follow us on our Facebook devotions each morning uh, know that just recently, and the um, actually maybe it's a couple months ago, but we went through the Sermon on the Mount kind of verse by verse. You can go back through the Facebook posts, you know, and still listen to those if you want to, and the Bible studies that follow. Um, so sermons. You know, sermons meant to change lives. You know, the word sermon itself is kind of a a neutral word. It's not really negative. It's not really positive. Sermon just means to say something, to speak. You know, so it's a it's a a declaration. It's a it's maybe teaching. It's it's something that that we hear. And in our American context, and especially the word sermon has a religious connotation. So usually it's some kind of religious speech that is given. And for some reason, for some people, sermon has kind of a negative kind of connotation. You know, for some people, you know, have you ever heard the phrase, don't preach at me? You know, that sounds like something negative. Now us pastors, we take that as a positive thing. You know, preach to me. Preach, you know, preach more to me. (laughs) But usually it's don't preach at me. Or don't sermonize. You know, you're sermonizing. Um... And so, for some reason, and by the way, here's another example of that. I've never really had somebody complain when the sermon is short. You know, like, 10-minute sermon? No, nobody's come out and say, well, Pat, well, actually, just one time, my very first sermon, I think, as a pastor, um, one, one of the elders came out of my first church and said, I was kind of waiting for more. <laughs> that was the only time. So in 34 years, nobody else has said, complained about it. But when you go long, you know, people start going like this out there, cut it off. Um, you know, it's funny how people get a little sensitive about the length of a sermon then. I wonder if they ever did that with Jesus, you know, or the Apostle Paul when he preached long sermons. So we heard a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So there in that one verse, we hear really what the content of Jesus' sermons were all about. Let me read it again. Jesus went about all Galilee, 
and he was preaching, he was teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. There's the content of Jesus' sermons. And it's actually the content of all Christian sermons today. At least it should be, right? It should be about the gospel, the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God's grace into the lives of people through Jesus Christ. That Jesus coming into the world is the entrance. It's the crashing in of the kingdom of God into this broken, sinful, dark world to bring good news. Good news because God cares for his people. He loves his people. Even he came in as one of his people, as a human being, to give his life on a cross, to pay for the sins of the world, and then to defeat sin, death, and the devil by rising from the dead. There's the content of all good sermons. That was the content of Jesus preaching. Now, that content was meant to change lives. So how did it work? I mean, how did Jesus really preach? I'm going to take this example of Jesus uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, in Matthew chapter 4, that verse 23 that I just read, you know, it says that he went teaching in the synagogues and preaching of the coming of the kingdom. So teaching and preaching. So preaching means proclamation. It means to declare something. And Jesus said things like, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's a declaration, right? Repent of our sins. Come before God and know that the kingdom of God is near to us through Jesus. Or when Jesus, or when the Apostle Paul said, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's a declaration. That's a proclamation. That's preaching in its pure sense, declaring that only salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Or how about Jesus when he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. That's a proclamation. That's a declaration. Either we believe it or we don't believe it. You know, there's really no in-between ground. So it's a the listening of the proclamation, believing what is spoken, that's preaching. But then it also says Jesus was teaching, teaching in the synagogues. Well, when you think of teaching, I guess I think about instruction, explanation, you know, trying to not just make a declaration, but explain it. So it says that Jesus did both, preaching and teaching. It's interesting, when I was thinking about becoming a pastor, I was about 20 years old and I was in college at one of our state schools here in Wisconsin, and I went back to my home pastor, and we had this talk about it, you know, what does it mean to be a pastor, is this something for me or not? And he said, future sermons need to be more, more teaching, more teaching sermons. And what he meant by that was people know less about the Bible than they used to. Now, we have an advantage here at Peace Lutheran, and by the way, I want to commend the congregation because we have a school, and those kids learn about the Bible and God every day in school, and these kids are learning a lot. They're smart, um, and they're being fed that. They're, they're actually above the curve on knowing, uh, have biblical you know, uh, knowledge, and so that's great. But overall, overall in our society today and in our culture, people are more biblically illiterate than they used to be. So that's why my pastor said more or teaching sermons. People need to know, you know, what the Bible says. So Jesus already saw the need for teaching sermons 2,000 years ago. You know, if you go look back at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, here's what it says. This is Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Teach them. And then, the very next verse is the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, and so forth. So for the next three chapters, he's teaching his disciples. We call it the Sermon on the Mount because it's preaching, but it's also a teaching, a teaching and proclamation. 
All right, let's zero in on this a little bit here in this text today uh, in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is right after the Beatitudes. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So, did you hear in that one verse both the proclamation, the preaching, and the teaching? Right? So the, the proclamation, you are the salt of the earth. That is a statement. Either we believe it or we don't believe it. Then Now you can ask, well, what did he mean by that? When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, I don't know if I want to be salt. I mean, my doctor said, less salt. It's better for your heart. <laughs> right? Or I think of salt as, isn't that the stuff you pour on the sidewalk so the ice melts? You know, is, do I want to be salt like that and be poured out on ice? Mm. But then you put yourself in the mindset of the, of the first century hearer, uh, those people, the disciples and the crowd that was there listening to Jesus that day, and they're thinking, salt? Now that's valuable stuff. Salt is the stuff, and it's about the only stuff they used to preserve food back in the first century. They didn't have refrigerators, they didn't have freezers. Salt is valuable. And also salt was used, and you probably have heard this before, salt was actually used to pay Roman soldiers because it was so valuable. It was used as we use it today to give food a better taste. It was used actually in, in medicine as an antiseptic for healing. It was, in the Old Testament, it has a really interesting phrase about salt, that God made a covenant of salt with his people. And, and you know, as a modern day hearer, you think, what in the world was God thinking? A covenant of salt. And what that meant is salt was used as a preservative. So when God you made a covenant, it was to be long-lasting, persevering, long-lasting love for his people. So it was called a covenant of salt. So when people heard Jesus say, you are the salt of the earth, it made a huge impact on them. They were like, wow, that is really neat. That is amazing that God would consider me of such value to say that we are salt in this earth and that we can be part of his plan, his kingdom, to bring his good news to this world, bring God's preservation to this world, God's uh, uh, ingredients to this world. And then he goes on to explain, right? He goes on with the teaching part. He says... But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under, under people's feet. So Jesus explains, if salt loses its saltiness, then it's no good. Throw it out. So we get our saltiness, our value, our worth from Jesus. So we have to be connected to Jesus, right? Right? We need to stay connected to Jesus and faith and discipleship and following him and learning from his word, those things we've been discussing over the last five weeks, you know, growing in our faith, ignoring Jesus, living without Jesus, not listening to his word or abiding by it, it's going to end up in disaster. It's going to hurt us. And then just to make the point even more clear, he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All right, I think you got it now, right? From that little paragraph of two verses in Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount, did you hear the proclamation? Did you hear the preaching? You are the light of the world. That's a statement. Again, we believe it or we don't believe it, but Jesus says it, so we believe it, right? He says, you are the light of the world. You and I, not just Jesus. He is the light of the world, obviously. But he says, if you're connected to him, you are light. Now again, putting yourself in the shoes of a first century hearer, that's going to sound a little different. I mean, today we have lots of access to light. Right? In fact, in this sanctuary, in this worship space, we have too much light. I will tell you that. We switched out to LED lights. We had to turn some off. If you look up at the spotlights up here that are shining 
on the altar. We had to shut eight of our lights off. It was too bright. Couldn't see the screens, for instance, what's going on. So we're, we're actually waiting for... We have some lights still, I think, on a boat coming from China <laughs> and waiting for them to arrive. But back in the first century, light was precious. And this is, a, this is a type of oil lamp that they used back in the first century. You know, this is all they had in their house at night. They might have one or two of these. And then, you know, you blow that out, it's completely dark. They didn't have night lights. <laughs> you know, they didn't have a kind of light you could just flip on in your house and just leave on all the time. So light was precious. It was either oil lamps or torches outside. That was it for lights. No street lights, no electricity. So when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, it made an impact on the hearers. It's like, wow, again, how valuable is light? God must think and love me immensely to call me light. But then go, Jesus goes on with the teaching, right? He said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Right? So here's what we need to do with that light. We need to let it shine. We just don't keep it to ourselves. We don't hide it under some kind of basket of some sort. We don't blow it out. But instead, we let it shine to the world, a city on a hill with all these lamps that are lit and the torches are lit. And we need to let the world know about the, the light of Christ that came into this world through His life and death and resurrection that they too might know the light and have the light and be light in this world. So we do that through our words and our actions, our good works, it says here. So by obeying those commandments God gave us and, and shining the light through the way we treat others, the words that come out of our mouth, the good actions that we do, the help that we give, the prayers that we send up for those in need. That's doing the good works of God. That is bringing light. That's the teaching that Jesus was giving to his disciples. So if you want to make a preacher squirm, some people like to do that, um, here's what you do. You come out of the church service and you shake his hand and you say, that was a really good sermon, pastor. I really enjoyed it. Why would that make the preacher squirm? Because sermons are supposed to kind of make you squirm. <laughs> They're supposed to make you think. You're always going to hear law and gospel in a Lutheran sermon. So the law always kind of hits us between the eyes a little bit, right? It reminds us, boy, I'm not always light in the world, am I? I struggle at times being salt. I sometimes don't hear the word of God and understand it or follow the teaching of Jesus. And so... But it's also a time to hear the gospel. You know, so you do want to know that, you know what, Jesus came for us, my sins are forgiven, and he gives me the strength to carry on and to move forward in my life of discipleship. Um, and so rather than saying, hey, good job, pastor, you know, I, I really liked your sermon, I really enjoyed it, maybe something like this. Thanks for sharing the word of God today. You know, thank you, that word of God that I heard really I took to heart today and uh and thanks Lord and thanks uh pastor for making me think <laughs> thanks for making me maybe think about my faith a little bit remember the apostle Paul I think he was actually a dull preacher um know what he said in first Corinthians in that passage that we just had um in our epistle reading today he said I didn't come with eloquent speech or with uh you know, fancy words and wisdom, but to proclaim Jesus Christ. And then you have that incident in the book of Acts where he was preaching all night long and then the Eutychus was sitting in the window and he fell asleep during the sermon and fell out the window, fell backwards under the street and died. And then Paul had to raise him from the dead, you know. And, uh, and so it wasn't Paul's fancy speech or, you know, powerful preaching necessarily. It was the Word of God. That needed to be taught. It was Jesus Christ people needed to be pointed to. I think that's the ultimate compliment for the preacher is, you preach Jesus today. That's fantastic. And, and, it, and it came into my heart and into my life. Thank you for that. 
Sometimes people have said, you know, I didn't get anything out of that sermon. You know, every sermon that is preached on the Word of God, there is something to be gotten. There is something that can be learned. There is something that we will hear and proclaim to us. And so I pray that every sermon from this pulpit, whoever's preaching, you know, that we hear the Word of God and we're appointed to Jesus and we have proclamation and teaching, law and gospel, to God be the glory for His glorious Word that we can share from here but also take out to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.